So let's welcome Mr. Leo Ramirez. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okie doke. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Team Austin, for having me here tonight. Um, and thank you all for, uh, for coming. Um, I, will, I will say first and foremost, I don't, I'm not going to have all the answers in the world. Uh, this is a framework to get you thinking about uh, corporate culture. Um, and uh, I have 30 minutes. If we had a couple of hours, we can really, really dig. Um, but I want to give you an overview of, uh, of what I've seen it takes to create great cultures at companies. Uh, how many of you all are business owners here? Anybody? A lot. Cool. Um, so I had the privilege of working at a company, was mentioned in my, my bio called Trilogy, uh, 20 years ago. So I moved to Austin 20 years ago from Stanford. Um, and I was at Stanford for four years. Uh, but I grew up in Texas, in deep south Texas. And, uh, but, this, but Trilogy is really the, the precursor of a lot of, uh, literally a lot of what you all see in workplaces today that are considered really, really cool companies. Uh, the, the cool perks, the, the high pay, the tremendous opportunities for advancement, uh, crazy recruiting um, cultures. It, it, a lot of it started right here in Austin, Texas uh, at this company called Trilogy. Um, Trilogy kind of imploded in 2001. Uh, we had gotten up to a couple thousand employees and then went down to a couple hundred and now they're a fraction of what they used to be, still doing pretty amazing work in a very different way. But the people that left that had been recruited by Trilogy, which are some of the top recruits you know, in, uh, around the world, ended up becoming executives of some of the top firms uh, and, and creating their own companies and, and have brought a lot of the best practices of culture into their respective organizations. Companies like Indeed, uh, for example, have a lot of folks that used to be at, uh, at, at Trilogy um, and are borrowing from some of that culture. So a lot of what I've learned over the years kind of came, started at that experience. Um, and uh, I kind of want to kind of paint uh, an approach to what I believe it takes to, to build a strong corporate cult culture within this presentation. Um, spend about 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, happy to answer any questions you have after that. So culture is not necessarily equal to perks. Um, these are nice. Trilogy did have a speedboat. We actually had four uh, when I worked there. For $25, you can rent a speedboat for four hours. That was one of our cool perks. We had foosball tables, you know, fully stocked kitchens. This is what a lot of people associate uh, with, with being, uh, having a great culture. Uh, but there's a whole lot more to it than that. Great culture matters because it improves employee productivity. It, it allows you to retain and attract top talent. Uh, allows you to build a stronger brand image and customer loyalty and increase customer conversion rates. These two last points are kind of the crux of this presentation. Is I'm going to argue today that by focusing on, uh, on culture and really kind of taking a, uh, an employee-centric approach to building strong culture, you can therefore attain uh, strong customer loyalty and conversion rates. Um, and at the end of the day, of course, have very happy shareholders. So what's, why does it matter? Of Fortune's 2015 best companies to work for, those companies outperform the S&P 500 by two to one. Uh, and this is an example of some of the companies, and you probably associate these companies with having a really strong culture, uh, whatever that means to you. Um, next slide. Um, why do people stay at companies? And these are the top five reasons according to Harvard Business Review. Um, they have pride in the organization. They really love the company and what, and what it does, what they do. Um, they are compatible with their supervisors. Right? So they have a really good relationship with management. Um, compensation, number three. Right? So many of us hiring managers focus so much on how much do we, do, do we need to compensate our people, but having pride and, building, and having a good relationship with the manager is more important than pay. Um, affiliation, I want to work with people that, that are doing something exciting. They're smart. They're going to make me better. That's what affiliation means. And finally, I'm doing meaningful work. Right? My, my company, my job has purpose. Um, whoa, that can... OK, so the framework for this discussion is going to revolve around, um, I don't know if you all know about psychology and Maslow's hierarchy of need. You see this all over the place in um, uh, different manifestations. But essentially, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of need states that we have a certain set of basic needs that have to be met before we can move up the pyramid uh, and achieve our physiological needs 
and then get to a point of self-fulfillment. So what do our basic needs look like? They're physiological, like food, water, warmth, and rest. They're safety, like security. Um, once we go up into psychological needs, we're talking about esteem. So I feel good that I've done uh, some amazing work and someone's recognizing me for that. And I feel like I belong and I'm loved. And then the next level, self-fulfillment. When I achieve those initial four levels in Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of need, I can then achieve self-actualization. So how do I then manifest myself into the world? How do I make a bigger difference uh, among my family, my friends, my spheres of influence? Um, so this is, again, going to be the framework for, for this discussion. The employee's hierarchy of needs, uh, uh, I will say, um, looks very, very similar. But it starts with a set of values. So every culture starts with a set of core values. And I don't know if you all heard of the Culturati Summit, uh, the Entrepreneurs Foundation uh, locally put on earlier in the year. Um, but it was their first uh, summit, and I went to a bunch of different sessions. They were talking about culture, and how important it is, and they had Zappos there, and they had Container Store, and they had Netflix, and uh, Southwest Airlines. And the, the common thread across all of them, because people were wondering what, is val what, what are values, what is culture? Really, values is the bedrock of culture. You start with a set of core values. These things almost never change at your company. You know, your company five, 10, 50 years later is gonna have very similar looking core values. Your culture changes, the identity changes as your people change you. But you bring in people that align with core values. And if there's a disalignment in core values, you probably don't want them, all right? Because nothing sours uh, a, a culture more than, than someone that with misaligned core values. On top of that are benefits, 401k, compensation, um, uh, healthcare, right? These form the basic needs of an individual. So if you can make them feel like I'm being taken care of, I'm being paid well, my health is being uh, addressed, um, and, uh, and I really align with the values of this organization, then I got a good thing going, right? If you, if you have that going for you, you can get into engagement. Engagement's important, and that's the uh, psychological need of an individual because this is where people are actually doing the work. They believe in what the company is, uh, is, is doing. They feel safe, you know, as we've already established. And so they are, they are now engaged. They, they are closing deals. They are making others in the organization better. Um, and then finally, um, once they achieve mastery and engagement, they go up to purpose. And in purpose, this is the self-fulfillment piece. This is where your, your leaders really form. These, these, these are the torch uh, bearers within an organization that multiply the effect of the passion that one has for an organization uh, internally and externally. Um, and I'll go into that in a little bit as well. Another view of, the, um, uh, of Maslow's hierarchy of need can be um, visualized when, when you think about this in terms of human resources and what they've been doing to uh, kind of focus on the employee and giving them what they need. Um, so back in, uh, at the end of World War II, um, about uh, 1943 or so, um, healthcare started to become a benefit in the workplace. And, uh, and if you didn't have healthcare, then you were not an attractive company to work for. So, so very, very quickly, businesses started adapting and adding uh, healthcare to their core benefits. Um, and then later, back in the early 70s, 1972, 73, 401ks were introduced. So now we're looking into the future and giving people some, some long-term stability um, and, and again, feeling safer. Um, then wellness uh, has been added over the last 10 years. So HR organizations are looking for um, uh, yoga, massage therapy, meditation uh, type programs that, uh, that help kind of round out an individual and make them well. And over the last couple of years, meaning uh, or purpose um, has been an important element of, of, of treating an, uh, an individual right and giving them what, what they need to be happy in the workplace. This is something I thought was, was, was a beautiful graph uh, that, that was presented by Ginger Hardage, who was the former vice president of culture at Southwest Airlines. Uh, she presented this at Culturati. Um, and and she, this is what Southwest Airlines believes. They believe that 
if you focus on the employee and you make them happy, then they're going to make the customers that they interact with happy. Right? Just, th th just imagine, if you will, um, you know, the happiest person you know and how they make you feel when you're around them. Now think of the most bitter person you know and how they make you feel when they're around them. Right? You kind of want to be around happy people. At least I hope, right? And, and the same holds true here. If you can make your employees happy, they're going to lead to happy customers. Happy customers are going to lead to happy shareholders, right? You're going to stick with your customers. You're going to get uh, more and more of the same. Uh, um, and, and so this is a constant cycle, and it's something that I want you all to remember. So let's dig into this pyramid again, um, and let's talk about basic needs for, for a little bit, uh, values and benefits, and what those are. I mentioned those. Uh, earlier. So what are your core values? This is all about what are the company's building blocks? What are you all about? Um, my company, NCAST, um, we, are, we have a platform called Giving as a Service. Uh, we call it the Hero Platform. We want to make heroes our, out of everyday people. We want to make giving a lifestyle. And we do that by incorporating philanthropy into our daily lives. Uh, it could be point of sale and e-commerce transactions. It could be payroll. It could be a, a, a deposit at the bank. Uh, it could be through a mobile app. It could be through a financial services institution. We want to be in your life. We want, to, we want to give you an opportunity to give wherever you are. So our core values are empathy, impact, uh, and generosity. And from those three core values, everything else builds uh, at our company. <clears throat> what do you believe? Um, and you got to know the difference between what you write and how you practice it. Because a lot of businesses make the mistake of saying we are these three or five things, but in practice they don't really uh, ex exhibit or or, uh, uh, or or show that they really believe in these things because they're they're behaving in a, in a disingenuous way um, against their core values. And then what are some benefits? Of course, we know healthcare, 401k, life insurance, open vacation policies, stock kitchens, work from home programs, massage therapy. You get the picture. So now let's dig higher up into the pyramid and talk about psychological needs in the form of employee engagement. Um, so what does strong employee engagement look like? Your employees are connected. They're connected to one another. They're connected to their managers. They're connected to other departments. They understand their purpose. They know what, what impact their job has on their, their department and the rest of the organization. Um, and they can easily communicate with others and get what they need. Um, their, their skill sets and their passions are aligned, right? That's what I, what I mean by role alignment. Um, there are growth opportunities. So people don't feel pigeonholed. People don't feel like there's a class ceiling. There is a world of possibility within the company, and you're, you're, you're giving them those opportunities to, to grow within the organization to their heart's content if they want to grow. Um, they are recognized for their good work. There's a great company in town called You Earned It uh, that allows you to kind of give uh, perks, uh, points to coworkers that are doing a really good job, and they can use those points for massage therapy and charitable donations and other purposes. Um, <clears throat> and it's one form of, of recognizing good work in your company um, that really helps to build strong engagement. Uh, training, uh, so do you have robust training programs to build uh, expertise um, and allow people to move into other areas uh, as well? And something that may sound a little strange uh, is this, this concept of compassionate leadership. Um, when I showed you the Harvard Business Review's you know, five reasons why people stay, number two was strong relationship with management. Um, compassionate leaders, and the statistic is 74% of employees who work for compassionate leaders say they're unlikely to leave their current organization in the next five years. So if you're not a compassionate leader, find a way to fix it. Right? That's a, I thought it was really compelling. Uh, and this came from um, a study from BI Worldwide. Um, and you may wonder, how do I know? How do I know if I'm doing a good job? And there's all sorts of tools and techniques to do that, but it comes down to two really simple questions. How do you feel about your work? And does your manager care about you as a total person? And if in every one-on-one, -on -one, uh, if every performance review, you, just, you, you make sure to ask these two really simple questions, it'll tell you a lot about how engaged uh, someone in your organization feels. Um, and there's a company in town called JDI that does something really interesting. So uh, a lot of us, um, when someone leaves, we want to find out why. 
and what was your experience, and what do we do well, what do we not do well? Well, why wait until someone's already out the door before you can find out why they're, why they're here? So instead of exit interviews, I'm a, I'm a big fan, or I've become a big fan of stay interviews. And, and so occasionally ask you know, your people, why do you still work here? What do you love about this place? What do, you don't like, what, what do you not like about this place? How can we make things better? Where are you stuck? How can I get things unstuck? Right? Being the compassionate leader that really, really takes um, interest in your employees and their wants and desires, um, and, and you demonstrate it by asking them why they're still around and how, how you can help make things better. And in terms of engagement, when all cylinders are firing, uh, you get higher productivity. So businesses with highly engaged teams uh, see a 20% increase in productivity. Uh, you have people uh, skipping out on work less often. So businesses see a drop in absenteeism uh, by 41% when teams are engaged at work. Uh, and you have lower employee turnover. So 40% of workers are planning to look for a new job within the next six months. Right? So think of your team, and 40% of those are already on their way out. And 69% they're already passively looking. Okay, kind of scary. And on average, highly engaged teams experience a 40% re reduction in turnover. 24% uh, of high turnover and 59% of low tur turnover organizations. So by focusing on engagement, focusing on these elements uh, to ensure that you have a highly engaged workforce, uh, you can avoid these issues and achieve the others. Let's go up the pyramid one, uh, uh, to purpose, self-fulfillment needs. So organizations that are purpose-driven um, have employees that tend to, to uh, outperform the rest. Um, they feel that, that their role, they feel that their company uh, has a higher purpose than just the, the, the fact that they're a developer or a marketer or they're doing inside sales. Um, what, is, what does it all mean, right? But if your company is giving back, if you are giving back, um, if there's some, some higher purpose, uh, then those types of organizations uh, tend to be much more formidable. And, and the people at that level tend to be much more creative, uh, they become uh, very strong leaders, and, uh, and are also very community oriented. And they care about not only improving the internal community, but also uh, impacting the external community uh, outside your walls. Um, and they truly believe that together we have a higher purpose. So how do we make that happen? How do we get uh, a boost of purpose into your organization? Um, and, and what I call employee and customer centric social impact. We're in an age today where uh, businesses are, are, uh, have realized that if they are not giving back in some way, they have sustainability initiatives, um, they are make, donating to charity, they are rallying employees around volunteer programs, if they're not doing those things, they are missing out and they'll probably end up suffering pretty handsome, handsomely for it. In fact, 65% of Fortune 500 companies have employee giving programs. 91% of consumers around the world believe that, customer, that companies need to do more to make a profit. And 50% of millennials accept the job and 52% stay at one because of a company's community programs. And the millennials are taking over, right? The baby boomers are retiring um, and, the, um, uh, and the millennials are taking more and more management positions, are taking more and more you know, important positions at companies and they, they care. They, they obviously care, and, th and these trends are growing every year as to how, uh, how they choose businesses to work for how they, and why they stay at businesses um, is, is that those businesses are giving back. The conference board and CECP survey of 250 multi-billion dollar uh, companies found that 85% measured and tracked social impact and 59% provided volunteer PTO. Um, and according to Harvard Business Review, um, why we work determines how well we work. Again, purpose-driven. I believe in this, and, th and this is why we're doing this work. Uh, and then higher customer satisfaction is linked to stronger employee motivation. So remember that happy, customer, happy employees, happy customers, happy shareholders uh, graph I had earlier. Um, this points to, to that, the importance there. If you can focus on your employees, make sure they have their basic needs met, make sure they're engaged, make sure they have purpose, then you're going to end up having much happier customers and a much stronger bottom line. So. 
you can transform your culture through social impact. Um, and wh what does that do for you? It raises brand affinity. Um, so there are 18 million plus businesses in, in the United States. And um, we, there are only a few thousand uh, businesses that are using technology to power their workplace giving programs today. So you want to be unique in the workplace, add some sort of a giving, giving program to your arsenal. Um, and it also is an opportunity to highlight your company's values. Um, you can boost employee happiness. So um, imagine having your employees out in the community volunteering. Um, and, and those five employees building a house, a habitat, or those 10 employees reading to children uh, at an elementary school, think of those interactions and think of how wonderful they're gonna feel doing that work. And, and then they bring that happiness back into the workplace. They talk about it, maybe inspire more people to give. Even if they don't, they themselves have now associated this act with coworkers as something very positive with the company, right? If you have a customer giving program at your company, uh, and, and you've seen these at Whole Foods and Central Market and um, uh, Starbucks, where you, you give some money to charity. Research has shown that uh, buyer's remorse is all but eliminated when you add a charitable deduction at the end. So you could have just bought a, a $2,000 TV, but, and you made a $1 donation, suddenly you have no more buyer's remorse. How weird is that? But it happens. Um, and so, and, and also, the customer has now associated that positive interaction with your brand. And that's exactly what you want, because you want them to come back for more, right? It's like a drug, uh, but a legal one. Um, and so you create deeper bonds with your employees and your customers. Um, it helps with skills development. So if you encourage your employees to go serve on boards, and your employees don't know how to read a P&L statement, they're going to learn to read a P&L statement when they're sitting on a board. Um, they're going to learn to work with others. They're going to learn to, you know, how, how companies work. And they're going to take those skill sets uh, that, that they're learning working with and for nonprofits back into your uh, company and, and helping you as well. Um, and there's organizational pride. You know, when you have a lot of folks going out in the community doing some good work and you're talking about it and uh, it just makes you feel good that my company has a higher purpose. Um, and finally, it does elevate marketing. So it blew me away back uh, eight years ago when I started my journey with mini donations. Uh, one of my mentors, Brett Hurt, who uh, founded Data.World and Bizarre Voice and Cormetrics before that. I met him at Cormetrics. I used to work for him there. Um, you know, I, I gave him the pitch for mini donations, and, and he said, Leo, don't build a damn thing yet. I said, why? He's like, well, you don't know what people want it. So go talk to all your old customers. And I had Walmart and Home Depot and, and uh, the, um, uh, Eddie Bauer and you know, some big, big name brands. And I, and I called them up and I said, hey, I want to do a Roundup for Charity at checkout. And so you make a purchase, you round it to the nearest dollar, you donate the difference to charity. What do you think? Love it, love it, love it, love it. And what was hilarious is that with every single organization, they kept directing me to the marketing people. And so I wanted to talk to social impact folks. I wanted to talk to the e-commerce people. It's the marketing people that always ended up taking my call. It's the marketing people that always cared about this because it's as, as, as uh, altruistic as, as you may want to believe the companies are. At the end of the day, they're, they're in business to make more money. And, and a lot of times they do social impact programs because it's going to mean more money to them. Um, and I don't know if you all know this statistic. Um, how many? Out of 100% out of, of the $372 billion given to charity in 2015, what percentage do you all think came from corporations? Just throw out numbers. Nope. 20? Nope. 10 closer. Much closer. What'd you say? Five. Who gets all the credit? 72% come from you all. They have better marketing, yeah. right? Now they're enablers, right? They're employers that are getting, that are paying people to, that are paying us to go give back, right? They are, they create programs to engage customers to give back, right? So they themselves are only giving five percent of their, uh, of all charitable giving of their own money to charity, but they're still enabling, and they can do a lot more to enable us to make a bigger difference in the world. So. Uh, but again, think of the marketing uh, impacts uh, as well here. 
So let's revisit this pyramid. And this is actually the last slide. He gave me the 10 minute warning. Um, and so I'm doing pretty good on time. This is the pyramid. The bedrock is values. You want to have some great employee benefits and create the basic needs so that your employees feel grounded. You then engage them and you give them opportunities to grow and be, be well connected with their passions and their skill sets to the roles in which they're doing. They have great relationship with their managers, you know, hopefully, uh, and they're becoming much more passionate and engaged people. And, and then they have purpose, right? They grow into that. And this is the traditional model where you want to build them up. And what I argue is purpose has to be built into every single layer. If you embed purpose into your values, then every experience up along this pyramid an individual has will have purpose built in. Right? It becomes habit. And, and so you're getting them ready to achieve that self-actualization by, by, by telling them, this matters to us. We're more than just making a profit. We are about giving back. We're about making a difference. We have a higher purpose together. And, and that, I, I would argue that incorporating social impact into your organization is important from the very beginning. When you're setting up your values and you're communicating those to your, uh, to your employees, have a core value that is about purpose. And with that, um, oops, anyway, uh, that is it. So um, thank you. You know, I know some of the people here run local businesses like cafes or restaurants. Wouldn't, would you say that this ideology applies just as much to that type of business as any big business? Um, so I'm a big fan of the little guy. Um, I started my philanthropic journey in, uh, 11 years ago to create uh, high growth ventures in economically distressed regions uh, because I, I came from South Texas and the economies there are driven a lot by um, uh, professional services, travel, retail, uh, and and there are a lot of little businesses that, that you know that are really lifting up the entire economy, um, and and so we wanted to do more of that. We wanted to cre create high growth ventures in these areas to kind of spur more innovation, spur more entrepreneurship, um, and then when I journeyed into mini donations, um, it was really all about. I mean, the whole purpose was little roundup donations. What could that do? Well, we calculated in Austin at the time that if every one of us rounded up their, uh, our donations over a weekend, uh, rather our purchase, every single purchase we make over the course of a weekend, if we rounded everyone to the nearest dollar, we would collectively raise over $5 million for charity. So I was like, holy cow, that's huge, right? This could change the world. Um, when I founded NCAST, uh, so before I was very donor focused with mini donations. So how do I get more people to give? I still want to do that, but I'm doing it through businesses. So I started thinking, well, why would a business want to work with us? And, uh, and there, are, there are other technologies out there that are helping larger businesses, the Apples and the you know, Walmarts and whatever the world, um, you know, have really strong employee giving programs. But I really wanted to create a solution that, that focused on small businesses. Um, five, 10, you know, 50 employees. Um, how do I bring the power of social impact and inject that into your organization to really create stronger bonds with your employees and your customers uh, and have a higher purpose to your company? And, um, and so I would argue absolutely any business can, can incorporate this into, um, into their strategy um, and have it you know, pay dividends. So I know it's a long answer to your question, but. Oh, hey, hey, Lisa. I own a business, but I also work for a corporation, mm -hmm. um, which is actually very well known for their culture. They educate other companies on it. Um, the problem is, and I guess I'm just asking for suggestions as an employee, my specific company was acquired by this other corporation, and that culture that they have is definitely not trickling down. <laughs> Mm -hmm. into the, the local office. I would remotely think, oh, no, but 
That's a lot of questions. Well, it, 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 it's a really complex uh, question to answer because there's a lot of layers here. You were acquired, so you were a business owner, and now you're an employee, and there's that dynamic, uh, which can be really weird, uh, depending on, on what role you were put into. So what? You know, I, I think it, it, a lot of it depends on, 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 on the culture of the organization uh, as it stands. Do, does the culture appreciate uh, pe that, people the, that... The culture of our company, the acquired is, is, is huge. I mean, they're known for it. The, the problem is, is if, if you have multiple offices yep. internationally that are, not, that are not absorbing that culture, that, you know, even in my own company, our teams that have actually been that are now supervised by by our new company mm -hmm. are way happier than other departments like me that are still being managed by our you know our local right. staff. That and that's precisely what I was gonna was gonna, I was gonna get at. That what I, what I've personally seen have been the most successful kind of M and A's um, is is one the M and A hopefully has some sort of a common ground in terms of values. Right. Yeah, it's course. part of the pyramid. And so if you, if you do come into it with that kind of understanding that there is some sort of a common ground, uh, then really let the, the organizations manage themselves. Let them have their own identities, right? There's this concept of microcultures within, within macrocultures in an organization. And so while the company may have a well-defined set of values and cultural elements, um, the organizations that are most successful, I believe, are the ones that allow for these microcultures to develop. And so basically microcultures are derivatives of the macrocultures uh, and they're implemented in a, in, in a smaller scale. Right? It could be an office, it could be, I'm sorry? That's my point, it's not if they're negative. If you have a positive culture, that's not being applied in a positive way to that other team, then our turnover rate, our turnover rate is not going to be as high as it would be if we didn't have that culture. Right, right. So it's the same thing for the people that are in the business Hey, you know, maybe your management should email you back in the next 12 days instead of taking three weeks to respond to. You right. know what I'm saying? Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, how do you as employees take action to make that culture actually happen mm -hmm. in your company when your supervisors are not doing that? Like, that, that's, the, that's the key is, is you can have this culture of the yin yang, but if your management teams are not applying that culture to right. your employees, then it's still going to fail. Yep. Yeah, well, you actually mentioned, mentioned a really important uh, uh, element that I did not touch on at all is 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 is, ma is manager buy-in. You know, you can have the most beautiful culture in the world, but if you don't have the the management team at all levels, uh, and it really starts from the top, right? They they epitomize your culture, uh, and they act in ways that are representative of that culture. And every single person down the line uh, uh, is an example of that. If they're not doing that, then you have a very toxic culture. That needs to that needs to be changed, but I can't begin to tell you how to fix it <laughs> in your situation. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, that, <laughs> that's really what it comes down to. <laughs> Thank you. That was that was awesome. Class tour. <laughs> hey, I have a question. Um, I have like a problem with communicating strategy to my team, so I would ask you. Communicating strategy to your team? Uh, no, 
No, actually, like, um, I don't know. We have, like, purpose and uh, quite interesting, like, social goals, but uh, when, like, we're communicating one to one, person to person, it's quite easy, but when uh, the problem starts when your uh, team is spread out in a city, in the world, it doesn't yep. matter. But we do not see person, like, day to day, on a day to day basis, how, what would be the most effective way to communicate your purpose, your strategy? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I personally love having uh, having weekly checkpoints uh, with uh, with the team, um, and and our I absolutely hate meetings, uh, and I, I want to have as few meetings as possible. So my meetings tend to be you know thirty minutes or less, um, and in those meetings I want I, I want them to be highly focused on the things that that you that you're gonna do. The things that you've done, the things you're going to do, and where you're stuck. Um, so I think that creates an environment where, where people want to bring to the table the things that they're proud of, that they've accomplished. Um, they, they want to talk about the things that they're going to, going to do, and, and they, want to, they want to feel that management is there and their coworkers are there to help them get unstuck in certain areas. So uh, that's one of the things we like doing in our, uh, in our weekly meetings, uh, which I really enjoy. And then two, I think you just have to constantly have a, a, a pulse of the organization, whether you use Slack or email uh, or conversations that you have one-on-one. -on -one. Every single interaction you have with an employee tells you a little something about, uh, about where they are, where your, where your culture is, and you can kind of paint a picture based on those interactions. And when you see deficiencies, uh, when you kind of start hearing the same things over and over from different people, you bring these, those up at these touch point meetings, whether it's weekly or biweekly or however it is you have them, um, and, uh, uh, and reinforce the things that, that you want them to, um, uh, to be doing. Um, but at the end of the day, remember what I wrote uh, earlier in the, in the presentation, that having a set of written uh, values is very different than a set of um, uh, actual values. It's the actual, the actual values is how you, how you live those values. And so if you say, you know, I want everyone to show up to the office at eight o'clock in the morning, and you show up at nine, as the CEO, you're showing up at nine, you're setting a bad example, you gotta show up at seven, right? So always one up your values so that you are a, a great example to other people. Uh, and, um, and that's kind of what I'll say, you know, just get a little, t uh, uh, get an idea of where people are, um, as often as you can, paint a picture of, 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 of where, where things are, and then dig into the, the, the deficiencies on a, on, a, on a regular basis. Okay, so it's mainly like the regular meetups and... You need to have them. I mean, if, if, if you let things go for too long, people are going to go off in their own you know, directions, and they may be uh, you know, disaligned with the work they should be doing. They, they, may, they may be... Um, uh, not living your uh, your values or your culture uh, as, as effectively, and so so frequent check-ins, at least I think once a week, uh, are critical, especially for uh, distributed teams. Hey. Yes. Hey. Um, so my background <laughs> is internal comms and culture management, mm -hmm. and I've always been at companies that are not really started. Yep. Um, so I've joined a company where the culture has been around for five, six years. What are some like pro tips in reversing or quote unquote? <laughs> Sounds like you. <laughs> like, like, reversing, like, what are like your top three tips on enhancing a besides like like improving their like there are definitely people between like written and what they actually do kind of values. Right. Um, I know you kind of touched on like buying from leadership. Mm -hmm. If there's any other pro tips you got for that. Um, you know, a, a lot of it starts with recruiting. And, and so culture is a really important uh, filter. And if you are, don't have a culture screen when you're recruiting, you may be letting in some bad eggs and those bad eggs are gonna spoil um, uh, your, your company. And so you really, really, that's one of the, the tips I, I would say is to make sure that your recruiting strategy uh, has a really strong emphasis on screening out people that are not good uh, culture fits. Um, if you're not doing a lot of of, uh, of hiring and you just kind of kind of 
uh, deal with who you got in your company. Um, I would say that, uh, I don't know, I, I think it's, it's really important to, to kind of hear out the individuals uh, in, in your team and, and what they're, why they're there. Uh, I talk, talked about say, say interviews before. Um, I would be open-minded to the possibility that, that the values that you hold so dear may be wrong, right? And, and, and the values of the company are really great for some reason. And so open-mindedness is, 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 I think, really important because that adaptability of, of uh, um, embracing what is there today that, is, that may or may not have worked, right? Um, and then either adapting to it or changing it. Um, it's going to take time, but, but I think being open-minded to, to, to maybe being wrong uh, is also an important uh, element. And then finally, I think it's just you know, acting in the, in the way that you want other people to, to behave uh, and, 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 and manifesting the values that you, you, you hold so dear and hopefully influencing them uh, into, into a way that, that you believe is important. Got time for one question? Sure. So you say creating a relationship with your manager, and obviously managers have other uh, responsibilities other than managing their team. Yep. What would you say as a manager an effective amount of time to put in the team? Like I've heard, a, if you're a manager, 80% of your time should be put into your team, and 20% of your time should be put into the task at hand. Mm -hmm. Like to really capitalize on building those relationships, if you are honing on a team, how much of your time should you be focusing on that team and balancing your responsibilities? Um, so that's a really great question, and I think it depends on the um, on the stage of your company. Um, I'm finding right now with my company having uh, you know seven full-time employees and uh, about six part-timers that I spend um, 20 to 25 percent of my time uh, managing, and the rest's on the task at hand. So my focus has really been on on bringing in people that are very strong cultural matches bringing a highly skilled um, uh, individuals into roles that they can own. And as a CEO, what I told, tell everyone that joins the company is, I'm, I just, this is your playground. This is the vision of the company. This is where we wanna go. These are all the wonderful things we're gonna do. This is your playground, right? Go build the monkey bars. Go build your, your apparatus, right? Go do the things that you believe are right within the vision and go surprise me. Right? Go make mistakes, go build something that breaks, right? learn from it, move on. Um, so so I, I want people that can come into that kind of environment and feel like they can make mistakes, feel like they can take ownership, feel that I'm not gonna micromanage them into doing what I want them to do. Um, uh, because every single one of us at a startup has to spend a ridiculous amount of time on the task at hand um, and in playing multiple uh, roles. As the company matures, um, you know, I worked for Sun Microsystems and Oracle. Uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, Oracle had a couple hundred thousand employees. Sun had 50, 75,000 employees when I was there. Um, and in management, I spent uh, probably 60 to 70 percent of my time managing uh, people, and the rest of my time, you know, a ta task in hand. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily. I, I don't know if, if Sun and Oracle were the best examples because I. I had, I had a good experience and a great experience at those companies that for me, they're more, more of a paycheck that allowed me to go do the things that I wanted to do with my nonprofits. Um, and, uh, uh, but I, you know, I, I see people management as being extremely, extremely important. Um, but my belief is that the more you can empower uh, people and, and most importantly, it starts with the, the, the more you can hire great people that can be empowered, that can take ownership, uh, the more you can focus on the task in hand. And look, like I tell my team too, I'm kind of a lazy guy, and I like, I'm really good at delegating, because <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do a lot of work. I want to enjoy my kids and my wife and my friends and like, en you know, enjoy life, right? And so, so the better I am at hiring great, empowering, and managing people, the more I can spend time having, you know, enjoy my company and enjoying life. So, thank you. Awesome, thank you, Leo.